Hi, today I'm going to talk about if you should ever use an isotropic hardening plasticity model to simulate the behavior of a polymer. And um, to start this, let's talk about first, what is an isotropic hardening plasticity model? It's a very common model that a lot of people use, and it's very easy to use. It's available in Abacus, ANSYS, LS Dyna, Comsol Multiphysics, and many other nonlinear finite element solvers. And the, the, remember, there are different kinds of plasticity models. We have the isotropic hardening plasticity, which we're going to talk about today. And then you have kinematic hardening plasticity, which is a different thing that I'm not covering here today. And um, there are other things, too, that you can talk about when it comes to plasticity. There are other models, but that's a different topic. Today, the focus is on isotropic hardening plasticity, and specifically rate-independent plasticity. Um, so how do we explain what this model is all about? Well, let's talk about first the stress strain response. It turns out you can explain isotropic hardening plasticity very easily by looking at the stress strain curve. So here is a prediction from an isotropic plasticity model of this kind. And the stress strain curve has a number of characteristics. The initial slope is the Young's modulus, and then we need the Poisson's ratio, of course. But beyond that, we need to know the initial yield stress of the material, and we need to know how the yield stress changes as the plastic strain is evolving in the material. So to specify this, in this model, we have a piecewise representation of the stress strain response beyond the yielding. So we would have uh, pairs of plastic strain and yield stress values, and we can have n number of those. In my example here, n is equal to 1, but you can certainly have a very large number of little segments to represent a true stress strain curve that you measure experimentally. Um, so that's how this model works and how you can understand what the parameters are. A few things to keep in mind though, if you use say 100 segments to represent the stress strain curve that you measure experimentally, that does not mean that you um, need to use 200 experiments just because you have 200 material parameters. The number of material parameters is really independent of that. One experiment is enough. Um, and I would also say that the number of material parameters that, it, that the material model needs, really, in general, has nothing to do with anything. I wouldn't care about that. What matters, really, is how hard it is to find these parameters. What kind of experiments uh, you need to use, and are the parameters unique? And finally, just because the material model has a lot of parameters does not mean you can fit an elephant, which is the common statement that I hear. How about unloading? This is one of the weaknesses of isotropic hardening plasticity. Um, we load it up to some stra strain value, and then we start unloading. Well, what happens during unloading is that we get elastic unloading until we get reverse plasticity. So it's linear elastic until we get reverse plasticity at the same level of yield stress as we had in the other side, in tension in this case. And that's not what happens with any polymer. This is not really realistic compared to experimental data. This is just how this material model behaves. Um, how about cyclic loading? So here's the first load cycle. I take a specimen, I pull on it, and then go in compression. Again, this is simulation. See, this is the hardening response. If I then continue, go back in tension with slightly larger strain amplitude, we get the larger stress. And then we unload, and the third time, we get this response. So what we see here is when you do cyclic loading on, on a material using this type of isotropic hardening plasticity, you get a yield stress envelope that keeps growing. Not what happens with any thermoplastic material that I have ever seen. Um, how, about, how about applying this in real life though? So here's experimental data for ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. I tested it in tension, compression, and cyclic loading. The blue curve is the prediction from isotropic hardening plasticity. And since we can fit this model with all the different parameters to the tension data, we can match that very well. But once we try to predict the other loading modes, in this case, the compression, the unloading, and the cyclic response, we see that they are not very well predicted at all. We have weird stuff happening in cyclic loading that we talked about. And also, kind of interesting, right? Just because we match the monotonic tension, does not mean we get a good prediction of monotonic compression. They don't come together, and it's not automatically true. So to summarize, if you want to use an isotropic hardening plasticity model, you really should only use it for thermoplastics or perhaps thermosets. Don't never use it for rubbers, foams, or anything soft. That's not a good choice. 
But the good news about this type of plasticity model is easy to use, it runs fast, and it can be accurate in some cases during monotonic loading, and it can also be combined with strain rate dependence, which is something I didn't really talk about here. The challenges are that it is not very good at predicting unloading the residual strain or cyclic response. You can't even predict tension and compression in, in monotonic loading in many cases because of differences between the two. So to summarize, yeah, you can use plasticity model in some cases, but you really need to use a lot of um, validation and, and, and caution to make sure that you don't get a very strange result. Because sometimes you can have significantly less accurate results than you think when you use a material model like this. Uh, most of the times, I wouldn't recommend using an isotropic hunting plasticity model, but in some cases, it may be a decent choice. So if you have any questions, you can ask them below.